Uh, one thing I might say is for us, remember we're going to be GPAs, so it's often at your base at the Western, not many actually get refused. They might get refused for the day, but they'll come back next week and prove. Yep. We might outright in refuse them. So it's often an issue of transfer to a tertiary institution if they're not suitable. So if we can just include that flavour tonight, that doesn't not so relevant to your Fanska trainees. Yeah. It almost makes it a harder decision. I remember I trained um, in a like quaternary hospital at the Alfred, and it's like it's it's almost easier when you have always have the most ridiculous resources for backup. You know, you've got ICU with specific neuro trauma and cardiac divisions. You know, it's it's incredible. They've got an ECMO service that can be mobilized to anywhere in the hospital in a matter of minutes. And then I did my um, country rotations in Geelong and Bendigo. I thought, oh my God, this is, and, and those are big hospitals. And I, and, I, and I just noticed palpably the difference about how I felt, about how I felt when I was having to crack on with certain things, knowing that, ah, oh, might be it. Uh, and uh, I feel, I feel, um, I really feel for you guys. And we're the next, what you guys call rural, we call regional. We are truly rural. We're the next step on again. Yeah. We're our resource, uh, not even having a physician or an HDU or anything like that. So yeah you know um yeah we don't even have a pediatric ward or all sorts of things so yeah that's um we're different yep it's um it's like that thing when uh, there's a few there's a few stages in life where you realize the buck stops with you and i think you know the first step is when you move from medical student to doctor and you go oh, you know sometimes the you know the buck stops with me and then the next phase is when you become a trainee in a program and then the next phase is when you become you know, a consultant. And then the next phase is even as a consultant, you've got lots of helpers, but then I imagine exactly what Greg, Greg is saying. Imagine that you're in that situation where you are literally the only doctor for a hundred miles. And, you know, I, I always think of ourselves as anesthetists in, in, uh, in, in, in our own niche. Um, once you've trained in a certain environment, you change many, many things once you move into another environment. And I think as you get more experience, you, you learn how to fluctuate between those situations very easily. Um, so, and, and one other point was a lot of fans just would think that um, they would be quite comfortable where we often work and they actually come out to do a locum and realize, my God, uh, I don't feel comfortable. And yet that's our work location. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Maybe you, come, maybe you become comfortable with this discomfort and uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, I guess, uh, sorry to buddy. Um, no, Dan, go for it. Thanks for um, taking the time tonight to present. Um, to answer your question, um, coming up with anesthetic plans and then presenting them, having the structured approach for that would be my biggest thing that, um, yeah, would be awesome to get out of yeah. tonight. Okay, that sounds good. Anyone yeah, else? So, that's right. These guys are all new, so uh, they would have struggled through their first presentations and uh, making a plan, so... Mm -hmm. Uh, just an introduction here. Lahira is a bit of a find for me last year. Um, he was out there training a lot of the uh, trainees and helping them through their first year. And so he sort of set himself up as an educator across the state and was also running a um, ABCs of anesthesia on YouTube and was recording a lot of his lectures that way. And uh, he started a boot camp for, at this time of year. That's going to be in May this year, May 15th. And I recommend that to all of you to sign up for that. That's an intense day of just this sort of thing. And maybe Lahira, you could just describe that to them because they can look forward to that. That's still junior, it's still early in the year. And just because it's Fanska based, there's a lot in there that's really relevant to any junior anesthetist. Can everyone see, can everyone see this slide, ABC's anesthesia? Yep. Looks uh, good, yep. Excellent, good, good. So yeah, it's just what I decided to call it one day. Uh, I started teaching this stuff a long time ago um, when I was a fourth year registrar. And I just thought, oh, you know what? I just need to put some stuff together of all the basics that I was never really taught. So over the next two years of your anesthetic training, you'll slowly get together a few things here and there, um, a few formats, a few structures. And I thought, you know, why aren't we teaching this? And I think it's because it's pretty low end. <laughs> yeah, when you, you know, you, you, everyone gets through it. And I just thought, actually, I can package this into a much easier way so that everything is there for you so the abc of anesthesia course is that um I, I give you everything i wish i knew in those first six months um which took me about two to three years actually to get all of those basics down uh so yeah if you want some information uh abc of anesthesia facebook group or the abc's of anesthesia at gmail.com is the email for that um, i've got a lot of resources on my website anesthesia collective as well 
Um, if you're really into the first part stuff, it's not something that the GP and anesthetic trainees get into, but uh, some of my colleagues, Stan Tay, he's fantastic. He won the prize for this little exam, um, which is actually a really big exam because you study for 12 months and it's really expensive and painful. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's one of those things where, so we're trying to make that more palatable. So if you've got, if, if you know, if you're driving out to your rotations or whatever it is, um, we're kind of integrating part one physiology with, um, uh, you know, make, making it as clinical as possible. So that is that. Uh, and yep, the channel is ABCs of anesthesia. That's the YouTube channel. Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty much that's pretty much me. Um, I'll, I'll ask people questions. I really want you to volunteer information as as much as you can. I believe that everyone here is capable, intelligent, cares about doing their best, and wants to improve. So, you know, I, I, I've just realized how much I wish I could be doing this in person with people um, because it's just so much more interactive. And I've been to a lot of Zoom talks previously. I really want this to be a conversation, you know, 50% me, 50% you at the bare minimum. Um, I've, you know, if, if, if this was in real life, we'd be talking, you know, evenly the whole time. And that's what I really would like to get out today. So, um, you know, please feel free to jump in at any time. Uh, so in the, in the course, kind of what I run is a step-by-step -step sequence before general, the general anesthetic and then the in-theater tasks. Um, so, you know, essentially step, you know, chronologically what you do is you assess the patient, you might consult other people and then optimize any disease states. You then consider the surgical issues. You then do a consent, you make an anesthetic plan, you present the case to your boss or to yourself if you, as you become independent. And then once you're in theater, you do a checklist, you drop your drugs, you get IV access, you position your patient, attach monitors and then induce the patient. And then finally you extubate the patient. And within that, there's a whole bunch of scenarios that occur. And these scenarios that are common when you start out is, you know, what do you do for the cardiac patient for non-cardiac surgery? What I mean by that is, you know, you get someone who's got some kind of issue, some, you know, chest pain or some shortness of breath or some decreased exercise, exercise tolerance. How do you know when to postpone or proceed? Um, and pretty much I'll, 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 I think what I'll do is because we only have a certain amount of time, I might give you a snippet of a few of these things just to get through a, a breadth of stuff, but give you the format to do it. Then you can go to the YouTube, my YouTube channel. I've literally got all my lectures there just for free, uh, which you can go through for all the content whenever you're, whenever you're bored. Um, so the common things that we do go through are cardiac patient, non-cardiac surgery, as I mentioned, airway management, crisis and problem solving, crisis resource management or CRM. And then the critical anesthesia inductions, which you know, obviously you'll get very used to time and time again. Um, so I thought I'd jump straight to whether to postpone or proceed. The reason I want to do that is the fact that you're going to be, uh, you, you'll get very good at doing these histories. And I think I can summarize that stuff pretty quickly for you and give you the essence of what I'm trying to get with a few exercises. Uh, whether to postpone or proceed, this is something that no one taught me until maybe in my like late basic training. So second year or th even third year of anesthetic training. And I thought, why on earth did no one tell me about this? Because this is one of the most common things you'll have to think about on a day-to-day -day basis. And especially if you're out rurally, this will, this will give you an evidence-based framework of what to do. So I might just jump to that straight away. Uh, any questions before I get, before I get started? You're recording, are you, Lahiru? Yeah, I'll record it. I'll put it on YouTube in the next week or so. Great, thank you. Easy. Okay, the cardiac patient for non-cardiac surgery. So this is a guideline that pretty much outlines everything. And this organization, ACC AHA, it's a great resource to have. You could literally Google ACC AHA and any cardiac word, whether it's atrial fibrillation, pacemakers, heart failure, and you'll get a really good set of, um, you know, the, the best, most recent expert consensus that almost everyone in the world, but especially, but especially um, uh, the Australians go by. So again, I have my opinion, the consultant over there has their opinion, Greg has his opinion, but you go with this guideline and that's, you, you really is the backing of all the experts of the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. So, so I'm basing this on the, you know, the standard that we all deal with. Now, this is the pretty busy flow chart which I'm going to simplify for you in a second. Uh, so my simple approach is every anesthetist really loves morning coffee. Um, I think Glenn just logged in. Hey, Glenn, what's the thing that you seem to, you know, we, we all seem to really prioritize every morning? Uh, definitely coffee. Uh, yeah, just right. From this, uh... <laughs> and, and it's probably the, 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 the strangest and weirdest part of that when you go from a surgical or medical rotation to anesthetics. 
these guys aren't doing much work, but they're really near their coffee break. And um, I was just as confused as everyone else when we were doing this. But that's why this mnemonic works. So every anesthetist really loves morning coffee. Now, what this means is that busy flowchart I had before literally breaks down to this. If it's an emergency case and there's varying degrees of emergency, you just proceed. You, you, know, you just do the best with what you can. That's that. A, anesthetist is active cardiac condition. Anything that's active, anything that's severe, whether it's severe valve stuff, severe heart failure, severe angina, um, severe arrhythmias, you just refer. You know that elective surgery cannot go on with such an unstable, severe problem. The next thing is risks. I, so you, there's a lot of ways of judging risk, but basically, if you can judge the risk of surgery to be extremely low, then you can proceed regardless of what the functional status of the patient is. Now, that, that really blew my mind. The fact that the patient can be really, really unwell, but if the risk of the surgery is low, think lumps, bumps, cataracts, you know, there's very little metabolic insult and therefore this is going to be safe for the patient to proceed. And we've got really good evidence on that. The next couple of categories are greater than four mets. So you just keep going down this flow chart, greater than four mets, you can proceed if they can achieve that. And then we'll testing change management. It's really evidence-based up until about greater than four mets. After that, it's less so. It's a lot of opinion. I want to give you the confidence to make decisions up to this point beyond which you might have to call your boss, at least in your first couple of years. Any questions about that? We'll get through some exercises now. Okay, so emergency surgery, there's no time for thorough evaluation and management. You simply just optimize the patient, you increase monitoring and crack on. This is the this is almost easier for me. I have less less I have less of a thought process in this because I'm not trying to decide, oh, you know, patient's got a bit of heart failure, some new chest pain. What do I do? Do I postpone? Do I not? It's easy. Pa you know, ruptured AAA, go straight into theater and do the best I can. It's not great for the patient, but it's a far easier decision for the anesthetist. Now, I'm just going to ask someone, what do you reckon the active cardiac conditions are? And sorry, I hope I don't mind. Just because I'm in the interest of time, I'm just going to pick on people uh, as we go along. And oh, actually, Greg, I'm going to ask you to pick on someone because I've got no names here. Yeah, sure. Um, and we'll leave out the ones who are just here curious about being a GPA in the future because that wouldn't be fair. That's fine. All yeah. right. Lloyd. Yeah, Lloyd, he's never shy. Go ahead, Lloyd. So active cardiac conditions would be something where you see this patient in an ED and suspect that they might be having an acute coronary syndrome, <clears throat> yep. recently recovering from, yep. recently recovering from an intervention like cabbage, valvular surgery, any of those sorts of direct myocardial events. Someone who's experiencing angina in an unstable fashion at yes. the moment, or who's got a restrictive flow or pulmonary hypertension around some valves that are dysfunctioning. And what kind of valves are bad? Yeah, aortic stenosis is a bad thing. Yep. Aortic stenosis with regurgitation is a very bad thing. That's right. So the great thing about this document, they actually outline a lot of the stuff that you said. Uh, MI, they actually, they, they got the data. Less than 60 days is a lot worse than after 60 days. Um, severe, unstable, or, or unstable angina, decompensated heart failure, severe valves. So they really care about severe aortic stenosis and symptomatic mitral stenosis and significant arrhythmias. Anything that's too fast or too slow, really, really bad. This is, you know, this is unstable, is active, we refer. So just, just think about what that means. The patient is elective and they've got one of these, do not pass go, go directly to the next referral. Um, what is low risk surgery? I know, Glenn, what do you reckon? Uh, low risk surgery is um, maybe a very short procedure, one that relies on a uh, maybe a sedation or a low level of anesthesia um, surgery for a generally well and healthy patient. Um, yeah, that's good. So I like that you said surgery for someone, someone that's short and often just needs sedation. And the interesting thing is that's, a, I've actually never heard that answer, but that that's actually a right heuristic. Uh, the reason it's right is because most Surgery that's low risk has very little metabolic insult to the body. So imagine a lump or bump. So, you know, you've got a breast lump that needs incision, an incision that big. That is very little healing for the body to do. Maybe it's a, um, you know, just a lipoma on the forearm, very little healing. Cataract, very little healing. 
So because it's such a minor insult to the body, just by that, it, you often just need a bit of sedation, if that, a bit of local anesthetic, um, and it's often short, simply because that lesion is going to be so small and the, you know, the body can just recover from this. So low risk surgery is really anything you can do with probably sedation and is short and encompasses this gamut of stuff. So scopes, cataracts, superficial surgery, breast lumps, and, you know, ambulatory surgery is stuff that, you know, they could just walk in, you know, out of hospital for pretty easily. That's, that's probably the best rule to go by. The fancier way is to use the risk calculators and you could, you know, you would, you'd suggest that a less than 1% risk of mortality is low risk, but I'd go by the first one uh, in the first instance. Afterwards, when you, you start getting more experience, you'll have more, you'll have more familiarity making decisions with the risk calculators. The one that I use very commonly for consent, I'll go through this in my course, is www.riskcalculator.facs.org. Fantastic thing. It really helps with my own understanding of what mortality and mobility is with numbers, because sometimes, you know, all we've got is our impression. Even surgeons just have their own N equals whatever it is per year. They don't have a great concept of what the mortality and morbidity of this patient would be, but this risk calculator is, is you know, millions of cases. So that's a really, um, yeah, good, good thing to use. But lower surgery, let's just say it's the uh, very minor surgeries, minor operations. Uh, next person along, what's a MET? Let's throw to uh, Daniel Brownstein. Do you know what a MET is? Yep. So a MET is the amount of oxygen required for consumption at rest. One MET being a person of healthy, uh, of normal health at rest, and four being walking a kilometre or on a long flight or up two flights of stairs. Yeah, and you you kind of hit 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 the nail on the head there. So. One MET is someone's metabolic activity at rest. And for a 70 kilo, 40 year old male, it's about 3.5 mils of oxygen uh, per kilo per minute, around 250 mils per minute. That's a very famous kind of number that we'll all know about. And then multiples of that. So the Duke Activity Status Index, you know, if you go on the website, <laughs> they've just got METs for every different activity you could imagine doing. Uh, so this is interesting for me because the new, the, the 2014 guidelines show that if you have greater than 10 METs or are capable of doing that, which is pretty much anyone in this room, uh, in the Zoom room rather, uh, your survival after a procedure is really likely to be good. And that's level 2A evidence. So you know, it's very, very good evidence. Uh, so here's, you know, here's the detail of it. It's funny how they, they, th they throw a lot of different values, but the Duke's activity status, which defines MET and has done a lot of the research on it, they've literally defined walking 5.6 kilometers per hour um, you know, level surface, level brisk firm surface, stay climbing at a slow pace. They don't define two flights of stairs, but that's, that's really great that you mentioned that because that was another big study, massive study that made us realize, I guess, confirmed that having that metabolic activity enables you to have lower risk for surgery. Uh, that particular study said uh, two flights of stairs and they measured out these steps as well. It was 20 steps per flight of stairs, six inches per step, you know, they got really detailed into this and they found that anyone that could do two flights had less mortality and morbidity. Uh, they also mentioned four blocks <laughs> and they define the number of blocks as well. If you can get through that without stopping, you'll be fine. So let's say you're in, Daniel, I might ask you, so let's say you're, you've are you got a patient, think of that typical total knee replacement patient. You're not really sure that they're, they're obese, they're you know not very active. How do you know that they can achieve MET? Yeah, it's quite difficult to determine that if they're limited by pain. Yeah. Uh, so what, what could you do? You could do things like cardiac testing, the butamine stress tests, so on yeah. and so forth. Now, I, I, like, like Greg was saying, up to a lot of you guys will be in rural remote settings. You might not be able to get a stress test for a while. Uh, what is something you could do literally knowing that what a MET equals? What could you do? Oh, I'm not too sure, sorry. Yeah, you, you, could, you could walk them up two flights of stairs. You, I mean, you said it in the answer, right? You, you knew this answer. <laughs> uh, so often if you can find some stairs, the real practical thing to do is seeing how difficult that might be for a, for a patient to do. Just get them walking up. Maybe they've got you know, knee pain, so they really can't do that. And then the safest thing to do is to go ahead, you know, go ahead with cardiac stress testing, exactly like you said, or some kind of you know, dobutamine stress test. But you know, that's one of those things where people have been just literally in their, in their, you know, sofa for ages. 
And all you have to do is just get them to walk and see what their functional status can be. I'm like, I really get down to the detail. I, I, after a while, I, I won't just ask the question, how much can you walk? I'll actually find out if they can't do four flights, can they do activities around the house? And it just gives me a rough guide. Are they, you know, are they doing the mowing? Uh, actually, I've, I've asked that question before. Do you do the mowing? And they've said yes. And then when I probed, they said, yeah, it's right on mower. So you just got to be careful exactly what they're doing. Um, but that's a really good question. Now, why is it, why, why do METs equal survival? Like what's, what's that about? Uh, so obviously having major surgery puts the body under significant physiological pressure. So having the reserve to be able to deal with that and supply oxygen to the tissues in response to this pressure is important, um, which is why we worry about METs. That's exactly right. Uh, you, you can, what, what, what we're doing here is we're comparing the, we're recovering the metabolic activity required to recover from surgery. So all the tissue healing, dealing with complications, all of that stuff is roughly more than four mets or can be up to four mets, let's say, depending on the, you know, what, what occurs and how big the, big the wound is and all that kind of stuff. So this is why it's so important. A lot of the mortality of when I, was, when I started anesthetics, and you'll probably feel this when you're doing your anesthetic rotations, you'll feel that uh, this, this is really dangerous. I give propofol, I give succimethonium or whatever I give, patient's not breathing, blood pressure drops. It feels like it's a very dangerous time. And it is, except that you're going to be there to sort out most of the things in a very intensive way. You know, it's like, you know, you're really just this highly skilled doctor right at the patient's bedside, looking at every beat of their heart, and you'll make sure that you'll, you know, sort things out. Most of the mortality doesn't happen in theater. There's very few, you know, like the risk of an anesthesia death on the table is about one in, one in 140,000 in the last triennial, triennial report, sorry, 114,000. It's, it's very, very safe. The mortality from surgery happens afterwards. And that's where these METs mean that the patient's gonna be safe or not. Finally, will testing change management? So if yes, you know, go ahead. If no, continue with the operation. So the reason that this is, um, I, I'd say, practically speaking, we always err on the side of continue, sorry, you know, doing a cardiac test. The reason is a lot of, a lot of, you know, a lot of interventions these days are very non-invasive, even if it's a valve replacement, you can do it with a TAVI, you know, a very non-invasive kind of method of surgery. So the question, will testing change management these days is almost always yes. So a good rule of thumb is, it, you know, just to say yes to that question, especially when you're junior asking that question and not being too, I guess, too, um, you know, radical with what, what we're doing and going ahead with an operation with less, in, less than ideal information is probably worthwhile. Okay, let's, let's go through a few scenarios. Okay, 68-year-old, uh, non-STEMI, two weeks prior, ongoing unstable angina, high-speed MVA, don't know why they're driving, but high-speed MVA, free fluid in the abdomen. Surgeon wants to proceed to theater urgently. What do you do? Next person all along. I guess Pops it's gonna. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I guess it's an emergency surgery. They're probably anticoagulated. They're gonna bleed a lot. Um, but if it's life-saving, it needs to happen, I suppose. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's urgent. It's very urgent. It's super urgent. You got no choice. The patient's having a heart attack. You play, repl you replace the blood. You get the heart rate optimized. You try to, you know, optimize uh, oxygen supply demand of the heart, and you crack on. So you supersize your management with, you know, get make sure you've got an art line. Maintain that coronary perfusion pressure. Transfuses required, as I mentioned. Analgesia to reduce unnecessary tachycardia. And if relevant, you may want to use a beta blocker if, if things are getting really hairy. Now, there's a couple of other situations. So let's say a fractured NOF. This is going to be so common. Multiple comorbidities, ischemic heart disease, atrial fibrillation, unknown exercise tolerance, obviously, because they're from a nursing home, probably currently in pain and signs of fluid overload and mentally alert, uh, but still mentally alert. What, what do you do? I think we can. Um, if patient is stable and uh, we can optimize the patient, uh, we can prepare the patient for the forecoming surgery. We can do some block and get some pain management, uh, get um, AF in control, um, anticoagulate him accordingly. And we have got a bit of time to get the patient ready for the 
patient uh, for the for the surgery uh, because there's, there's it's a lot not... of good point. there's a lot of good points you mentioned i'm just going to uh, go down into some of those how long do you have is this emergency or is it elective it is emergency but i think it's not an urgent urgent thing it, it can wait for a uh, few days as long as neurovascularity is intact and uh, uh, because it's all about risk and benefit. If he's in fluid overload, it means that he's got a, some kind of CCA going on, congestive heart failure going on, um, depending upon what's his smoking his component of you know, pulmonary edema. Um, there may be a COPD underlying, so we do not know exactly what's the real you know, medical picture, medical really background like, of this patient. I really like everything you're saying. So your gut feeling is right. If things aren't quite right, it's not triple A ruptured urgent, but it isn't a lap coli elective. This is somewhere in between. So just now you mentioned all these really great points. And what I'm all about is synthesizing to what is exactly necessary at any one time to make a decision, which is, can be very hard to do, especially when you're junior. So in, in all the complexity that you'll, that you'll see, I'm going to give you some numbers. This is now urgent, like this is now urgent surgery. Therefore, it has to happen within about 24 to 48 hours. And they've got good evidence for NOFs. Must be done preferably in 24 hours, but maybe 48 if you need to optimize things. You mentioned some things to optimize, which are, fan which are fantastic. Um, the Australasian anesthesia, which is uh, officially known as the Blue Book, talks about the commonly, commonly um, optimizable things, I guess. Rapid AF, optimizable in about 24 hours. You know, give some atoprolol, digoxin, maybe, am maybe amiodarone. CCF fluid overload, give some fruzamide, severe sepsis, start some antibiotics, treat the pneumonia, whatever it is. HB has dropped, there's a bleed, give some blood. Now, these are concrete things that you can simplify a very complex situation to make the patient as best as possible. But we know that mortality rises incredibly fast in a fractured NOF sitting around for 48 hours. So uh, that was a really great that was a really great you know, exposure to all the kind of complexities, but know that we can synthesize this situation every single time and just crack on. Uh, NOFs are great, by the way. NOFs are the reason we get good at anesthesia. These are about the most highest risk patients you'll ever do in the you know, non-weird cardiac, weird respiratory, lung transplant kind of setting. And time and time again, we can anesthetize these patients really safely. So you'll, you'll get a lot of your experience at high risk cases simply by doing NOF. So, you know, once you become a consultant, it's just the bane of your existence to do this sometimes, but it's, it make it makes us tough. So, you know, if, if you're, if you're in the country getting lots of NOFs, really appreciate for what it is, you'll realize how safe you can make this for, for your patients. Why and, it is, uh, where this number 24 to 48 hours uh, has come uh, for yeah, NOF repair? That, that's a good question. I don't have the reference for it. It's talked about a lot. There was a, there was a, there was a paper and a, or it was actually, no, it was a recommendation. I've actually got the resource. So I'll, I'll try to email it to Greg and put the link up. There's a, there's a really good resource. I think it's the AAGBI or another national audit project from the UK, from the UK. Uh, so next case, 70 year old male PR bleeding secondary to colon carcinoma, diabetic cholesterol, hypertension, unknown exercise tolerance. So kind of a typical general, you know, general stuff going on unknown exercise tolerance. So again, I want you guys to think of every anesthetist loves morning coffee. What is this next person along? What do you want to do? Postpone or proceed? So, uh, well, in this case, again, what is the hemodynamic status of the patient? How bad is the PR bleeding? What's the hemoglobin? And how bad or good is just because I'm kind of trying, in control. Because I'm kind of trying to do a specific format for this to gain understanding. And again, you're right. All your questions are right, except the fact that I, I, I'm trying to get through a, um, a format to make all situations identifiable. So what do you reckon? Is this emergency or elective? It's emergency, semi-emergency, I would say. Absolutely. Based on, again, the fact, if the hemoglobin is 70, it's profusely bleeding, then it is emergency emergency it has to be dealt straight away that's great but if so hemoglobin is 100 say, and there is a bit of just that's great no so what i'm going to say is um colon carcinoma it's a cancer this is that you know semi-urgent exactly as you said so most people would not want to delay more than two weeks for a potentially malignant carcinoma 
Now, what does that mean for this? This is in E. So every anesthesis, E emergency, this is still in that category. You don't have time to do the stress test and then, you know, do your stent or whatever. You, you, that's just not practical. You have to crack on with a, you know, complex discussion. HB is low, you replace it. There's PR bleeding, there's, there's, you know, there's limited other treatment and you can, you can optimize any of these individual things. But what we're saying is, is this a cardiac patient? Is this a coronary artery disease that needs intervention? We'd argue that that would be a very difficult to intervene with at this point. So it's urgent. I might just at that point um, introduce a rural aspect to this too, is yes. if that patient was just for say a colonoscopy and you knew just from a digital exam or whatever, it's going to be a carcinoma, maybe it's better to refer now if you're sure they're going to get a colectomy. I mean, have the whole treatment done at the major hospital. Why do part of it and then package them on and send them off? Unless there's some doubt and the, the, the scope is going to make a lot of difference. Agree? That's a fantastic observation. You know, if, if, if you've got to be realistic about all the resources, and you're right, you'd, you'd have that nuanced discussion. You'd talk about, talk to your patient and, all, and find out all your resources, and absolutely doing everything in the one center could be, could be life saving for that patient. So I had a, exactly the same patient a few months ago. He did have a PR bleed on routine um, uh, FOBT, and then he had a um, CT scan for some other reason, which found out some uh, tumor mass um, in sigmoid colon, which he was, the patient was actually waiting to see the specialist and have the colonoscopy or whatever. And while he was waiting, he had a PR bleed and presented to the emergency department. Mm. So we, it was a known kind of a, you know, a highly suspected tumor, which bled on that night. So his hemoglobin is okay. He was, he was hemodynamically pretty stable. So we just uh, didn't waste time and transfer him to the referral hospital. Exactly the same situation. Exactly. So what I want to get out of this is there's a very specific format. Every anesthetist loves morning coffee. This is how you know and get, a, get very informed guidelines about whether to postpone or proceed. All the other details can be hatched out. So this document defines emergency, urgent, or time sensitive. And that's where you can, you know, you know that this all falls within that emergency kind of category. Uh, the more time sensitive it gets, or the more elective it gets to, then it's a bit more complicated about what you exactly what exactly have to do. Okay, let's go to the next one. So, six-year-old lady for lap collie. This will be for Jess Morgan, just so she can. Jess Morgan's yeah, okay. up in Alice Spring. Hi, Jess from Alice. Uh, this for you. So she has chronic AF now with a rate of one hundred and forty, no symptoms. Uh, what do you do based on this framework? And I'd really like you to talk through the framework and everyone else have a thought of think about it too. So this is an elective operation Absolutely. Um, to start with. So I've written down the acronym and I can't remember everything that it stands for. And that's right. We can get through um, so, Yeah. So um, it's an elective procedure. She does have, um, I guess, active, well, not quite active cardiac disease in that it's a stable condition, but she isn't rate controlled. Actually, so you, um, you said however, the right thing there first. So pretty much you, you've now said she has chronic AF, but the rate is yeah. 140. So it was stable, but now it's completely an active cardiac condition. So you, that's exactly right. So based on that, what do you do? Postpone or proceed? Postpone. I uh, postpone. <laughs> that's exactly It could right. even be very briefly until she's rate controlled. Exactly. Sometimes all you need is a bit of deduction. Maybe they missed their dose of beta blocker or whatever, but that you can hatch out. This right now, as it stands, you call cardiology, you get your supervisor on, on the phone, you go, hey, what, what do we do? And you try something. And if you just can't get the rate down, trust me, you don't want to be in theater doing a lap collie with someone with an uncontrolled rate. That's just an absolute disaster, unless you want to practice direct cardioversion synchronized. Now, just to give you a bit of complexity here, if she had potential biliary sepsis, something that was the inciting problem for the tachycardia, then you, you probably need to crack on. But that now becomes an emergency condition. That is the source of the heart rate of 150, potentially the source. And that's where it gets more complicated, just to give you a bit of insight into that. Uh, Greg, can you pick someone else as well? 60-year-old female, laparotomy, incisional hernia repair. Patient this is going to be for Kyle, Kyle Dunlop, who's, um, who's here. He's, a, he's in Brisbane. Beautiful. Hey, Carl from Brisbane, you notice the systolic murmur in this patient. What do you do? Yeah. 
failing that, he might sorry. not have a... Hello, I might there need to unmute first. I'm sorry, that's awkward. Good. So it's a... Um, oh, and I said hello, everybody, before, but I was muted at the time. <laughs> um, so it's an elective procedure, and there is a potential for an active cardiac condition. Beautiful. I don't exactly know what that is. And feel the discomfort with that. It's potentially active, and I don't know if it's active. So what do you do? So I would need to test or seek more information really absolutely um, now, yeah. let's let's make this a bit more complicated so if it was a systolic movement that's active what what lesion is that that is active um so it's either aortic stenosis or mitral regurg beautiful and which one of those is really concerning aortic stenosis fantastic severe mr you crack on it's not the worst thing severe yeah. mr with severe you know heart failure symptoms absolutely but severe mr as it stands not too much of a problem and well tolerated under anesthesia. Uh, but yeah, AX is severe or Hockham. That's the other one. You really don't want this to be a thing. Um, and maybe Greg can provide a real perspective. So from my point of view, if the patient has no other signs of severity, so it doesn't no syncopal episodes, no heart failure, no, you know, bad heart failure, uh, and no current angina and no other kind of clinical indicators of a, of a problem, I'd probably crack on with this case. Uh, depending on what the urgency was for the patient, et cetera. Uh, how, how about in the rural context, like how, you know, how quickly can you get an echo in some centers? Uh, generally generally not. So uh, as a rule, you'd expect not. It does raise, raise also the issue that whether a spinal is safer than a uh, GA in this case, and when it comes to cardiac conditions, it's not necessarily the, the best choice as distinct from respiratory conditions, correct? Yeah, that's right. Look, uh, and and there's there's a lot of thought in the culture of Australian anesthesia that anyone with aortic stenosis doesn't get a spinal. I haven't seen that borne out in every, any evidence. Again, a lot of the mortality studies of, you know, these kind of conditions are just perioperatively. It's, you know, whether they've had a spinal or a GA, but if they've had a big incision and they have a real requirement to increase the cardiac output, having that fixed orifice and that fixed cardiac output really, you know, can increase your chance of risk um, above and beyond whether you had a GR or spinal. Um, but that, that's that's a, uh, probably a bit more complicated discussion for another time. Mm -hmm. Okay, this one. Every now and again, you get this. Uh, Greg, who do you want to choose? Uh, Kenny. Kenny, you're next. Kenny, uh, you're Kenny's on. in Harvey Bay, I think. Oh, nice. Yep. Uh, Harvey Bay, no way. Yeah, hi, how you going? Um, so I joined late, just got here. I didn't get what the acronym was. Oh, the acronym here, um, it is yes. uh, every anesthetist loves morning coffee, and, but it stands for if it's an emergency, you crack on, and if it's active, you postpone. That's where we're up to, and we'll, I'll go through the rest of the stuff as we go on. Uh, so what do you reckon? 50-year-old okay. male, inguinal hernia repair with trifascicular block. You'll get this maybe once a year, uh, and the patient has multiple fainting episodes. So is this emergency surgery, Carl? Sorry, not Carl. Oh, it's, it's definitely not an emergency. It's more um, an elective. Fantastic. Unless it's kind of encarcerated in yeah, one and a half or a lactate of seven, probably it's, it's not. It's elective. Uh, is this an active cardiac condition then? Because we're moving down that flow chart. Yeah, it, it is an active cardiac condition. I mean, the patient is symptomatic with it. Exactly. And, um, so I, yeah. and what is the condition that's probably happening here? Uh, Trifascicular block, what could go? Um... Uh, Trifascicular block with a normal heart rate is usually well tolerated, but if they get multiple fainting episodes, it's becoming something else, which this happens rarely. So you're talking about Hockham or are you talking about dilatic cardiomyopathy? That is... Oh, no, it's uh, oh. just the trifascicular block can, can very rarely go into a third degree heart block for whatever reason. So that now okay. becomes... Uh, an active cardiac condition. This, this is interesting. Every time I have, I see one of these, I call the cardiologist and they don't care. Uh, they just say, yep, that's fine. As long as there's no symptoms occurring, but I've just made this a bit more mm -hmm. interesting. So try a block with no symptoms, very stable, uh, but with fainting episodes, that means something else is going on. And your gut feeling- Yeah, well, we, we do do them a fair bit. We do see them a fair bit and they're not symptomatic, but when they, when they have symptoms, it's a concern. Yeah, that's right. They're headed for a pacemaker. Okay, so these are all active cardiac conditions. They have high mortality, postpone, refer. It's, it, it, it's easy. Like this is, this is the thing I wish I learned straight away because I remember going for the first two years thinking, 
how do I know what to do? Like, why is one consultant saying this? And then, you know, in what, you know, what is the nuance? I had nothing to hang this framework on. So uh, now this one. Next one's going to be uh, Danny Clark in Darwin, please, Danny. Fantastic. So Danny, 78 year old female with recent echo showing moderate aortic stenosis. So moderate aortic stenosis for cataract surgery is unable to walk up a flight of stairs due to arthritis. What do you reckon? Just step me through the uh, flow, through the flow chart, through the algorithm. Yep. So we've got a, um, it's, it's not an emergency. Yes. Um, so it's an electric procedure. Uh, it is a, um, uh, I mean, moderate aortic stenosis is a, you know, I guess, a active cardiac condition. Um, she's got some pretty poor um, exercise tolerance associated with that. Oh no, sorry, due to due to arthritis. Um, so I guess uh, it would kind of boil down to the um, you know, patient factors, surgical factors. The surgery is um, you're, you're, yeah. Not you're, active, so now you said uh, it's not emergency elective. Then you said it's not an active cardiac condition. What's the very next step before we get really complicated? Uh, so risk. Is this low risk? It is low risk. Great. Yes. What do you do? I don't think we can crack on. Yeah, it's that easy. Uh, so great. I, I don't care what else is happening. I, I do cataracts probably, you know, tw 10 to 20 of these a week. And it is, it is that, it is that well evidence-based and straightforward when you get these operations. If this was, a, you know, any other lump or bump for local insulation, same thing. Maybe if it's a colonoscopy requiring a bit more propofol in an anxious patient. Yeah. Maybe we're getting to something where you have to worry a bit about a bit more about the human dynamics. But this patient, regardless of the fact that their exercise tolerance is terrible uh, and they're old and have a lot of other stuff going on, this operation is incredibly safe. Now, Lahir, um, the ne next one will be Stephen Switzer, but before uh, he's in, um, he's also an analyst. Before mm. we go on with that, um, if we've got no resources to fall back on mm. and we are planning a type of anesthesia, such as an arm block or a spinal, and that's going to, or even a, a, a local anesthetic uh, with a touch of sedation cataract. If everything goes fine, that's okay. But what happens when the spinal fails, patient gets pain during the thing, the arm block fails, the surgeon discovers he's just cut an artery. We kind of got ourselves into a corner here where we never really wanted to go ahead and do a GA on this sick, unstable, pa sick patient. Yeah, good. So the first thing is that uh, whether you're having an eye block or a spinal or regional, they're very two very separate things in my mind. For example, if this patient couldn't tolerate, uh, if the block failed in this patient, the, any any ophthalmic surgeon would be able to do, you know, a consultant surgeon will be able to do this under topical anyway. Like this is this is the minor, the most minor of operations. In the situation where you've got a high risk patient and you've decided to go ahead and I, I never base that decision on whether to go ahead on whether I'm going to do regional or not, because the mortality again is not from the operation. It's post-operation. You, you can give me any scenario, literally any scenario. And, you know, I, I, it, it just won't matter for the mortality of that patient, whether I, whether I do a GA original, it might be less harrowing for me. For example, I've got um, the worst renal end stage renal failure patient with cardiac disease and an ejection, ejection fraction of 20 or whatever it is. I will, once you're a consultant anesthetist, you will still, you know, experienced anesthetist, you will still get that patient through with a GA or a regional technique. The mortality be roughly the same because once the anesthetic's worn off, it's, you know, it, it's worn off. It's such a, there's very little metabolic insult after the time of the anesthetic wearing off. As long as you do a stable induction, that's a whole other thing. You need the experience for that. I, so I hope that makes sense. I'll never base my decision to proceed based on which anesthetic I'm doing. Uh, you, you know, if, if, if I do an arm block and the arm block wears off, I know I need to be able to do a GA safely in this patient. So that's always at the back of my mind. Plus I've got to have the ability to do it safely. I've got to have the experience of doing tricky patients and doing that. But once I get them out of that, all their mortality is afterwards. And if it's an AV fistula, it's very, very low. That, that might not be, I, I, I realize what you're saying as well. When, when I did most of my training, it, I just had this feeling like, you know, if, you, if I don't give a GA, things are safer, things are nicer for the patient. And I know that if the arm block works perfectly, it's a far more, less interesting anesthetic for me. 
I sit back, relax, give a bit of sedation and play my cross, you know, play my Sudoku or whatever we want to do. Um, but just, yeah, I, I, I never go ahead with an anesthetic based on whether I can do a regional or not. Now I'm going to skip forward. Uh, uh, to, to, so what I'm going to do, um, there's, there's more to this, to go through the flow chart through the exercises. Um, so literally it's uh, this, this whole lecture or a very similar lecture is on the ABCs of anesthesia YouTube channel under the ABCs of anesthesia bootcamp playlist. Um, but I want to give you a bit of a, a, a sample of what these ideas are for your first rotation. So now just to go ahead, what I want to do in the interest of time, like as you go further and further along, things get a bit more hairy. That's that's fine, and you'll 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 be able to make those decisions based on that flow chart. Now, this isn't just the cardiac patient, so that's why we really want to talk about here. Let's say you've got a fifty-year-old for elective inguinal hernia repair, active wheezing last week. So if they're actively wheezing, you know there's an active cardiac condition. It's not the sorry, it's it's, it's the equivalent of an active cardiac condition. So active wheezing means that you need to postpone and treat. This might just be giving some Ventolin and Atrovent and you know, rechecking, reauscultating the lungs, uh, but you don't, you don't proceed with someone who's actively wheezing for an elective operation. So I sort that out. And then once it's well controlled and optimized, I then can go ahead. So if it's elective surgery, but no active conditions and it's low risk, I can proceed. So I'm using the same, same format for anything. Uh, so 30 year old elective open collie, known COPD, multi multiple exacerbations recently. What do you do? Again, it's elective operation, E is elective, A, it's act active, so I postpone and treat. But now if they come back to me, now it's well controlled COPD. And I find out what they're, you know, I find that, so it's elective, no active state. Uh, is it low risk surgery? Well, elective collie, elective open collie is definitely an, a moderate risk operation. I then check the exercise tolerance. If they've got good exercise tolerance, tolerance, then I can proceed. So that's pretty much the framework I want you guys to think about for, for this. Uh, so it's really, it's, you know, let's use the same algorithm for non cardiac disease. Uh, any questions about that before we move on to kind of the history taking presenting the case? So yeah, in, look, in summary, this is an evidence-based approach. You know, it's not my opinion. It's not just my opinion. It's not anyone else's opinion. This is really good data for what, you know, whether your patient is going to do well or not. Knowing, to, knowing when to postpone or proceed uh, is just one of the most common things you will do day in, day out, especially in, the, you know, your country rotations when you get your tricky patients on your after-hours emergency lists. Now, I've just got these two QR codes. So there's a whole bunch of guidelines that I've gone through for the part two. When you're a GP and it's, it's a bit of a funny place. Most ANSCA trainees, they go through introductory training. Then they go through, you know, a year or maybe more if they fail their exam of just studying really, really esoteric physiology and pharmacology in way too much detail than, than, than is practical. And then after that, they start their part two. What, what, I, what I think is really important for you guys is having the frameworks that I teach in my, for my part two for my part two students. Um, so I've just gone through a whole bunch of guidelines and you know, one, what maybe after about six months of doing anesthetics, this stuff will be more relevant. So I've just got some QR codes there, but it's on, um, uh, it's under part two lectures or something on the, on the YouTube channel. Um, and literally I just go through everything you want to know about these particular guidelines and trust me, they'll come up time and time again for you guys. Uh, if, if not, if not in the next year, I mean, yeah, yeah definitely. Okay, let's see some cameras up, so I'll just hold off a second. Uh, I really apologize for cut, you know, cutting that short, by the way, but uh, I think it's far more interesting if I'm able to go through a few of these, a few of these other, other things as well with you guys. Okay, so this is... Uh, this is my kind of self-made document that I used to use something similar similar to this when I was doing my assessment. So look at this pre-filled assessment. Um, you know, if you can fill out this form, you'll be the level of a good basic training. So this is easy to do. This is just a checklist. Um, but my confidence as a consultant or supervisor is not necessarily, you know, whether you can 
you know, the depth of knowledge, but the fact that you can just cover all these points, I, I need to make sure that you, if, if I've said, if I have asked you that, to, that you've assessed this patient, that you've covered everything. Um, I don't go into this much detail with cardiovascular, respiratory or other, uh, but I do want to know that, you know, you've outlined the relevant diseases that they are. So what we can, so this is literally what I ask. And then I go into detail. So I want to know prior general anesthetic, post-operative nausea, vomiting, family history of issues, uh, cardiovascular, respiratory and other systems. Uh, someone mentioned, can you walk up two flights of stairs without stopping? That's a really good indicator that they're in a low risk group. If that occurs, I check the medications, check the allergies. Are they faster? Do they have any reflux? And that's its whole, whole other talk in itself. And then I do an airway exam, I auscultate the chest, dental exam, and then I note any relevant investigations. Now, so anyone can anyone can do this and use a checklist like that was like the one I've got there and just ask this over and over again for every patient. So the real challenge then is the application of this information. And so that's what we'll focus on. So what I might go through uh, is, you know, how to do this anesthetic assessment and um, then, you know, going, going through how to make this anesthetic plan. So the next thing we'll do is how to make an anesthetic plan. Um, hey, Greg, how long do I have for you guys? Okay, uh, we usually run till about a quarter past nine Victorian time. So you got uh, yeah, okay, good. You got twenty minutes. Actually, I'm, I might put it put it up to you. Uh, would you rather uh, me talk about how to make an anesthetic plan, or presenting the case to the boss, for kind of de delaying the most important issues? Uh, put your hands up if you want presenting the case, and then I'll be able to put your uh, you can put your hands up in the in the chat. I think under the participants um so lloyd's keen for planning um and daniel so a hands up means what uh I, uh, you can put a little um uh, there's a little uh, emoji that you can put yeah. on the screen no i mean when they put their hands up now they're voting oh. for uh oh, so putting your hands up is presenting the case and not putting yeah. your hands so, up making a plan all right it's uh oh we <laughs> plan. plan it's mainly plan Okay, creating a plan. Done. Which for the Victorian trainees, when we meet on Saturday, we're going to go through with David Wong um, uh, um, set pieces. So we're going to look at all the different anesthetics that you uh, operations you're likely to come across and oh, look good. at what type of anesthetic is likely to be sight unseen from the list. That that's great. That's that. That sounds like that's already being covered. So that that's really good that we're doing presenting the case. But it's only for Victorians, not afraid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they can stick it on some YouTube channel or whatever. Okay. So presenting the case. So this is this was a bit of an advanced thing for me, but again, really useful for you guys to think about in finding out what the point of difference or the critical issue in a particular case is. So the aim: simplify a complex situation. You know, think like a boss and predict the critical issues. Now the magic words are age, gender, and surgery, risk level, elective or emergency surgery. The main issues are, and you just outline these main issues. And then you think about your location of the hospital and who do you need? And you know, this is so important. When I was in a tertiary hospital, a quaternary hospital, I very rarely had to care about the location and who I needed because everyone was available to me. But man, when, you, when you're in the country, when you're, you know, when you're one of two or three anesthetists or by yourself, you, uh, you know, with very minimal other specialist support, you really need to, know, you really need to consider these issues. So I've just, th these seem to be some of the real high, high points of when I'm presenting the case to my boss. So now in more detail, this is once I've given that summary statement, presented the case in a, in a broad sense, I, th I can then always get down into more detail. So, you know, you get down to specifics because in your chart, in your anesthetic chart, you've already written all the detail of the other stuff. What I try to get out of my trainees is, okay, after you've done, you know, a, a hundred assessments, which you'll probably do in your, you know, your first few months, after you've done a hundred assessments, you'll notice patterns where things are just pretty normal. So, you know, this is a middle-aged elective lap collie. That's, there's nothing else interesting about that, but a middle-aged elective lap collie, Jehovah's Witness, that gets a bit more interesting. So I wouldn't present all the details. I'll say, look, this is, a, this is, I'll bundle it as that summary statement outlining that this is an otherwise normal elective lap collie, except for the fact that there's this extra critical issue. And that's what we're going to try and get out uh, in this exercise. So let's emphasize this. So 
after, you know, imagine you're taking lots of histories and they're all normal, fit, fit ASA1 patients. There's nothing really that interesting about this case. Everything's pretty normal. And this will in inevitably bore you. And that's good. That's the broken record of every patient assessment. And you want this to be, you want to learn what normal is to then delineate what abnormal is. And after a while, you'll really focus on abnormal because all the other stuff will take care of itself. So what I really care about is identifying the critical issues and planning for this. So <laughs> you assess a patient, plan a little, and then when I, when I first started doing this was for the Viva exam, the part two exam, this final specialty exam. So yeah, everyone panics a little when they get their Viva STEM. Um, and this is a really useful structure to communicate with the Viva examiners as well. So using that framework, I'll just put that slide up again, actually, um, just so you guys can follow this kind of rough guide. Take a photo of this slide if you can. I'll just give you five seconds to do that. Okay. And so I literally want you to just have a go at telling me these aspects uh, of the case. And if I haven't outlined where the hospital is, or whatever it is, I want you to then just take a gamble. Where, where do you think this, this case should ideally be done? So this will be Steve Switzer in Alice. Sounds good. Let's get on to Steve. So 45 year old male presents inguinal hernia repair, passage smoking, hypertension, cholesterol, and very active. What are your thoughts, Steve? Unmute Steve, if you haven't already, please. So I've got a middle-aged man with, for an elective procedure nice. um, that's otherwise, you know, fit in well, um, uncertain of his smoking history with good exercise tolerance. I think this can happen in, um, it is a, depending on, I guess, how extensive it is. It's a sort yeah. of low to, to moderate risk surgery um, and it could probably happen in, I, I guess, uh, a rural to regional center. Depending yeah, that's on perfect. And, and what you were getting, you know, what I was sensing from you and, you know, very rightly so is that this is a very standard case. So, you know, this is kind of the normal case and I've just outlined that as the first case. So a relatively low risk elective procedure, main issue, a few cardiac risk factors, but, you know, no one, none of us would be worried about this case at all. Um, I've discussed smoking session, maybe the extra thing you might want to chuck in, but in more detail, then you can go through actual detail if the if your supervisor really requires it, but they probably won't. Let's keep going and make it more interesting. A 50 year old female presents lap collie, passes your hypertension, runs marathons, you do your AOA assessment, melon patty four, thorough mental distance five uh, centimeters, small mouth opening. Uh, next person along. It should be um, Dasith, Dasith in um, La Trobe in Victoria. Very what do you what do you reckon about this case following that format? Um, so this is a fifty year old female for an elective lab coli. Um, she's otherwise well, greater than four meds of exercise tolerance, and um, however, there are some concerns regarding a difficult airway. Um, she's myelin party four with a small mouth opening and a tire mental distance less than six centimeters. So, okay, good. Keep following the format. Um, and I got a photo. Got to get it up. Um, I guess she's fairly um, moderate risk due to the um, airway. Absolutely. It's a um, elective surgery um i think it can happen in this hospital if it's in a tertiary center however we'll probably need a difficult airway trolley ready um a backup anesthetist around and um someone who might be able to do um awake fiber optic intubation or something if we need or i don't know if we get that far no that's actually really good so this plan you know, whatever you find on your assessment, then delineates what, you know, what, what you're going to plan for. So I've said 50 or female lap collie, relatively low risk elective procedure, except, you know, this is very high risk if you're a junior person or you don't have all the equipment that you need. So the circumstance suddenly makes this a real problem, depending on your own experience 
and the facilities and the equipment that you have. Imagine you don't have a video linguist. Imagine you don't have a bronc that's working. Uh, maybe you don't have an assistant with you who is very familiar with the equipment. That suddenly low risk elective becomes super, super high risk. So the dominant patient issue, as you rightly said, potentially difficult airway. And then this is everything. In more detail, I would then you know, think about whether this is difficult intubation, um, if bag mask ventilation, LMA ventilation should be fine, and then I tackle all that stuff and make a plan of my airway. And that's for a whole other airway talk, uh, which I'll go through in my course. Um, yep, and then my plan is to use a videoscope or a wake fiber optic, depending on what you make out as the risk. Let's keep going. So as you can see, I'm trying to get through not, I'm not talking about the, the, you know, the detail of exactly what I wrote down on my chart, but I'm thinking about what is most important about this case and was going to take most of my or my supervisor's time in managing the patient's safety. Because you know, guaranteed, you're not, one, you're not worried about post-operative nausea and vomiting in that case, and you're not worried about all those other kind of less important things. Everything about this case really is that difficult airway. So this will be Darren in uh, Newcastle. Excellent. Darren, what do you reckon there? 16-year-old male. Total knee replacement, hypertension, diabetic, active reflux, on even on an empty stomach, knee pain on 100 milligrams of OxyContin daily. What do you reckon? So we've got a 60 year old gentleman for a um, for uh, probably elective surgery just for the knee replacement as such. Yes. Uh, the hopefully controlled hypertension and type 2 diabetes. The active reflux is, is an issue in the fact that um, you, you'd be concerned about aspiration risks. And he's also got a, quite a high pain tolerance as well with regard to the oxycontin he's taking. Um, so in summary, uh, yeah, a six-year-old gent uh, for elective surgery, possible moderate risk level, just due to the fact of, of, the, of the reflux issue. And also the, the main issue would be of that of, of pain and how much um, uh, uh, analgesia you may require throughout the... Uh, the, uh, the surgery itself. Uh, Location-wise, um, possibly at a, a regional centre. Um, and, you know, from my point of view, obviously you'd be you'd discuss with the boss uh, regarding um, maybe RSI for this gentleman as well uh, for the induction. Beautiful. And as you'll realise, you'll have the options of doing a spinal or a general anaesthetic. Everything you said was right. So a lot of what you said was kind of the obvious stuff that I didn't, I didn't you know, any, any supervisor knows. But the fact that you then said, Look, I'm actually worried about the reflux. That might equal a rapid sequence induction. And I'm really concerned about the knee pain on that much OxyContin. And then the next stage of that is, if they're on that much OxyContin, what are you going to do about it? And so what are your thoughts? Have you, have you done much pain management anesthetics kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, funnily enough, I'm on APS this week as well. Oh, yes. um, really? yeah. Yeah. yeah, so for this gentleman, um, you'd, you'd possibly just uh, do a regional block as well. Um, uh, if, if that would help uh, pain management wise, uh, I'd probably, I'm not so uh, across hydromorphone as such, but I'd discuss it with my bosses basically to, to determine which would be the the, uh, the right one for him for possible PCA yeah. uh, and then maybe work out some non-opioid equivalents as well. Beautiful. I'm just going to give you all the practical things that someone might do and you're, you're absolutely right. So first of all, uh, if you give a spinal anesthetic has very little outcome benefit, except for decreased pain in the first 24 hours and potentially afterwards. So no mortality benefit, no real morbidity benefit, benefit, but there is pain benefit. So if the spinal anesthetic is good for anything, it's good for that. So you'll do regional intraoperatively. You'll do a regional technique that lasts longer than the operation. So that's the first two things after, aside from your multimodal analgesia, you might want to give a PCA with whatever you want to give ketamine infusion. Um, and potentially other anti-neuropathic agents. So those are really the, the armamentarium that every anesthetist has and every pain physician has for these patients with um, you know, a very painful operation and they're going to be you know, upregulation of all their opioid receptors. They're going to need a lot of stuff. And when you think about that, when I've, when I've stepped through all those different plans for pain management that I could be using, I'm thinking, look, this isn't for a center that doesn't have the ability to run a PCA and a ketamine infusion. Like I know some hospitals that I work at can't run ketamine infusion. So I would never put this patient on, uh, on, on in that hospital. If, you know, if, if, if they, if they really need this operation and they can't move, uh, you know, to another hospital, that's so very not ideal. I would have to, you know, consent them for the very likely chance of severe intractable pain. And that's not something I do lightly. So to summary, 
regionally regional anesthetic in the hospital uh, during the operation catheter technique or a longer lasting regional technique like a femoral nerve block and a saphenous nerve block plus or minus catheter pca ketamine infusion and maybe some anti maybe some pregabalin as well but those first four are the big ticket items that i might want to up 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 you know it's like upregulate for this patient patient and I'll just emphasize that point too, that yeah, for rural hospitals, we don't have pain things, we don't have specialty and it's quite destructive on the ward and it's not good to be called out a lot at night when you don't have any registrars and so forth for intractable pain and difficult. So we often screen these out. Um, good. So our next person is Vince in Launceston, Tazzy. Excellent, Vince. So here's a, here's a fun one. Nine-year-old female from a nursing home with a fractured knot for an open reduction internal fixation. Frail, dementia, deaf, hypertension, cholesterol, osteoporosis, glaucoma, incontinence, unknown exercise tolerance. Uh, what do you reckon? Just go through well, the, uh, do the uh, so got a 90 year old lady um, uh, for um, high risk surgery, uh, which is an emergency surgery. But in this context, depending on, it sounds like she's uh, it's hard from that information as possible. She could be late stage dementia. Um, so in which case, this is more of a palliative procedure. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of, a, I've, I've seen similar situations to this kind of debated a number of ways, mm. um, you know, in terms of what's best for the patient. Yes. Um, uh, and it's, it's a matter of, you know, what are the risks? Um, it, the, the chance of this lady dying from the, from the procedure is quite high. Um, you know, I've heard it argued that, mm. you know, not waking up from an anesthetic is is a more pleasant way to go than than um, you know dying more slowly over the course of several days after an insult like this. Mm. Um, but uh, you know, I, I, I've I've seen I've seen this kind of from this information I've seen um, this case kind of go a number of ways sort of um, mm. over the years. I think it kind of depends on a bit more nuanced look at, at her <laughs> functional right. status. Uh, I'd say. And, uh, the way you've answered that question is exactly the way all of us feel. You know, we're not really sure what the right answer is when you start getting these real complexities. You know, this is not just palliative. This is also someone who's frail with, you know, a very high chance of mortality in the immediate 12, uh, 12 24 hours afterwards. So 90-year-old female fractured off RF, high-risk urgent palliative procedure. And the dominant patient issues is this seriously high perioperative morbidity and unknown cardiorespiratory status. You, you want to check, and you know you've seen a few of these, and you've seen them go different ways, and that's exactly right. Like often, I'm looking at the NFR status and making you know modifications to that, or extending them to a different palliation process, and it's often a big con consent and family discussion. So, just the nature of this, um, besides the fact that this is a really high risk patient, you know, it's going to be re really tricky for us to anesthetize and be a lot of stress in that anesthetic, just getting the, keeping the blood pressures right, depending on how bad the kytic status is and how frail they really are. But a lot of my work in that discussion around this is not about that necessarily, you know, they get a GA, they get an art line. That's all very standard. Uh, but the NFR sta status and the consent and the family discussion, that's a really big part of what this very complex issue is. And your answer really kind of showed that, right? Like this is goes many different ways. It's very nuanced. It's very difficult. And then in more detail. And, on check, and check the patient's advanced with the directive as well. Oh yeah, NFR status, yeah, absolutely. Um, I know they're oh, called advanced care directives now, yeah. Good point. Uh, there's a, a rural nuance here too, before we go to Glenn, who's from Western, he's gonna answer the next one, Yeah. Um, is, is that, you know, do we want to send this poor old lady off to 400 k's away from where she lives and then she's got no family down in Adelaide or Perth or can we crack on here and uh, hope for the best because really that's often what they really want and the family and we can offer a wonderful um, you know last few months of life and sometimes we'll do it better than the city yeah absolutely Good, good. Uh, 18 year old female for a tonsillectomy for current tonsillitis. Glenn, what do you reckon? So no previous GAs, very active, suffers asthma occasionally, snores heavily, reported ap reportedly has apneas and recent cold, mentions that multiple members of family have nearly died under anesthesia, doesn't know why. <laughs> what, do you, what do you reckon? Yeah, so she, this is an 18 year old female presenting for a um, 
tonsillectomy. It's an elective procedure um, in an 18 year old who's otherwise fit and well, generally fairly low risk, but there are a couple of issues that jump out the page. Uh, one being that um, she's had multiple family members who have nearly died under anesthesia. So that screams MH or potentially an anaphylaxis to one of the drugs we like to use. Anything else? So <laughs> MH runs in families. Uh, there's one other thing that run, there's a couple of other things that run in families, but anaphylaxis doesn't actually run in families. But there's a oh, okay. Uh, but uh, that's definitely a um, something that would trigger me to maybe think we might need to look into this a bit more. Exactly. Uh, it sounds like she has a bit of asthma occasionally, but I'd ask just whether she, how often she uses her inhalers, and mm -hmm. if it's just when she's a little unwell, that's not so much an issue. Um, we can always do a stop bang score to see uh, whether she has. Um, uh, quite bad um, OSA or not, but in an 18 year old with a tonsillectomy, we're probably going to tube her anyway, so not too concerned uh, in regards to that having an impact on the airway. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's, a, there's so many things here to kind of unpack. So you do a whole asthma history, and that's something that you do on your interstate chart, and then you'd make an assessment of the severity and stability of this asthma and potentially optimize this before you go ahead. If she's had apneas, generally speaking for this tonsillectomy, you'd need to have a sleep study. Um, you do your stop bang. If anyone hasn't heard that stop bang is a risk stratification system. Um, it's a screening tool for whether they've got OSA, obstructive sleep apnea or not. And scores greater than four mean that it's you know, moderate, moderate to high risk of having OSA. And then they've recently had a cold. So this is a whole other thing. So there's a lot of documents out there for how to approach the patient for an elective operation with an upper respiratory tract infection that you know, depending on how severe it is, fever, sputum production, un their unwellness and other factors, you may want to postpone for, you know, even six weeks after this. Now, mentioning the multiple family members, there's only a few re few reasons that you get inherited serious problems with anesthesia. And one of those is malignant hypothermia that Glenn is absolutely right to have mentioned. Sucks apnea is another thing that runs in families. It doesn't usually kill someone because a patient is not breathing under anesthetic care will be ventilated and that will be all be completely appropriate. They might have awareness though, because they may have not realized that, the, that this patient uh, had sucks apnea and washed out all that volatile or propofol, not realizing that the patient was still paralyzed. Um, but one of the other, I guess, relatively common things that can come up, relatively speaking, that is, is any kind of congenital heart defects or rhythm defects, you know, uh, congenital QT abnormalities, things like that. Good. Now, yeah, what do you have to consider nearly dying on anesthesia? So, medical hypothermia, anaphylaxis, sucks apnea, congenital cardiac issues. I actually say, said anaphylaxis there. Um, and I feel like I've said that as a mistake, but I'll have to look into that. Okay, 30 year old female, G1P0, 29 weeks, presents the lay board with a blood pressure of 160, headache, and abdominal pain. Hey, Greg, who's the Lloyd next? in Townsville. Lloyd, please take it away. Lloyd, what do you reckon? This is, a, uh, this is a woman I actually dealt with on the weekend. But oh, um, this, this one. <laughs> so the conversation for the boss is that this is a, a prime uh, preterm at 29 weeks. So we've already got a fetal concern as well, who's indicating that she may be preeclamptic with an elevated blood pressure, some central nervous irritation with a headache and an abdominal pain. So she's in already in a, a high risk because she's preterm. Uh, and she has a condition which can then progress rapidly to eclampsia and require uh, either for her safety or for fetal uh, safety or both an emergency caesarean. So to give this as a summary, this is a 39-year-old woman presenting at only 29 weeks gestation with signs of early onset eclampsia, pre-eclampsia, uh, and they are three times hypertension, central nervous irritation with a headache, and abdominal pain suggesting cramping. She's likely to uh, be at significant risk or requesting from the uh, ONG team to have an urgent caesarean, still to be assessed further. The main issues at this stage are that we are going to have a 29 week uh, fetus delivered. 
and that this woman may well, in fact, progress to eclampsia from preeclampsia. Hmm. Fantastic. Location at the moment, yes. We'd need to keep her in a position where monitoring for the baby can continue and that laboratory investigations to see if she actually has any other changes like platelet changes, liver dysfunctions as part of the preeclamptic state mm -hmm. uh, and alert theatres that there is a woman who's at a very high risk of having a cat one caesarean requirement. Who do you need? I think you mentioned a few of them. Uh, what extra specialist resources would yeah, you need for this? So given that this is a preterm child uh, or fetus, this needs someone who can look after a, uh, or in fact, someone who may be able to retrieve from the facility post delivery, uh, a 29 week old child. We also need someone who can potentially give a high criticality of care. I don't know if it's an HU or an ICU, depending on where you're going for a woman who's potentially preeclamptic. Uh, and certainly I'd want obstetrician gynecologist available if not a GP ONG to be able to manage this, not simply being left to birthing unit nursing staff. Sounds good. And Greg, what do you reckon? Severe preeclampsia and preterm, where would this be managed? Would you have to transfer to tertiary obstetrics or? If you can get her out intact, that's one thing, or at least on magnesium and blood pressure control, uh, but you may have to crack on. Um, it's not a very desirable situation. Now, uh, now the she's not in labor, is she? Exactly, not in labor. So the interesting thing, uh, when I was going through med school in my junior years, I always thought that this was an urgent delivery of the fetus, but it, it, it just isn't. If the fetus is otherwise normal, you know, w without any issues, you will absolutely have to, you know, you would never go to theater until blood pressure had been managed and the patient was already on magnesium, you know, treat, you know trying to treat and prevent uh, seizures. But that was a really great summary. So 30 year old primate preterm, high risk urgent obstetric issue. And the dominant, dominant patient issue is likely severe preeclampsia. So that then, to me, everything's just a bit of a framework, really. Severe preeclampsia then means blood pressure, seizure management, complication management, whether it's coagulopathies, you know, neuro, neuro, neurology dysfunction, uh, or whatever else it is, and then timely delivery of the baby. So, you know, it's not urgent, but it's not, you know, it, it, it needs to be done at the time once everything else has been settled. And then who do I need? Yep, tertiary obstetric center, OBS, NICU. Um, and especially in this context, you know, if you're a rural GP, start thinking where you should be, where you ideally would like to be and who do you need? And you'll, uh, you'll get an idea of all the resources you have around, around you, whether you're in the city or, or the country. You know, if I'm in a, you know, a small hospital like Williamstown or Sandringham, this is a place without ICU, without, you know, on-site anesthetic support and other HG services, I still have to call adult retrieval services or NICU or PICU, depending where I am within the Melbourne kind of metro area. Let's do this as a final. I think there's time for one more, yeah. Yeah, yeah. sounds good. Let's go back to Jess Morgan uh, back in Alice Springs. Yeah, and uh, she's good. one who's done a lot of uh, uh, intensive care stuff. Nice, Robert, 74 year old male, ruptured AAA for a laparotomy rush to ED. Past history of all the usual stuff, vascular disease, stents, hypertension, and the blood pressure at this point is pretty low. What do you reckon? So this is a 74-year-old man who is for a triple A repair. It's an emergency procedure, um, high risk. The main issues are that he's already hypotensive um, and he's likely to deteriorate quite rapidly. Uh, we, I guess, don't have any choice but to go ahead to do it at the current location because he's unlikely to survive transfer. Um, and I would want to, if I had um, intensive care or high dependency, I'd want to notify them because he'll likely need to uh, be looked after there post-operatively um, and probably the blood bank, um, if he, he was likely to require massive transfusion protocol as well. And probably uh, um, if I wasn't, um, already with an anaesthetic consultant, I definitely would want an anaesthetic consultant. Great. What What is your wish list for your staff for this kind of case? Uh, uh, you, so you mentioned blood so bank. So I think blood bank hematology uh, that yeah. kind of goes hand in hand. ICU definitely would be ideally what you'd need. Uh, yeah. Tell me who else you want. A vascular surgeon. Absolutely. Or in my case, it would be a general surgeon. Yep. Uh, you and you want... said another pair of anaesthetic hands, so the anaesthetic consultants yeah. on. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
And um, there's one other person that might you might be able to call in. I don't know if you. I'm sure you do have this, Alice. But um, if you want to recycle the blood, if you call in as a perfusionist or cell saver. Oh, yeah, we definitely don't have that here. But yes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so we, uh, again, ideally, I'd need vascular surgeon, blood bank, ICU perfusionist, cell saver, hematologist, and any kind of massive transfusion needs. Uh, if any, the first time you do a massive transfusion, you just realize how many people well organized you need. So for example, to run the level one and get blood back and forth, uh, you may need a runner and two nurses just to run that. Um, you know, you, so I'll, so I'll save a perfusionist, two anesthetists, one to help manage all the lines and various other things with the resuscitation, another one to maintain hemodynamics and ventilation. Like there's just so many people you would ideally need. And I've been in centers where I've had very few people and centers where I've had more than enough people and it's learning how to manage those things. But that was a really good summary. So 74 year old male, ruptured triple A laparotomy, high risk emergency procedures is about as high risk as it gets. And the dominant patient issue for me, this is urgent transfer to theater. It's something that people don't mention all the time, but this patient doesn't need to be in ED for any longer than ever really. It needs essentially to be in theater, anesthetized, ready to you know do the laparotomy and get that cross clamp on the aorta to stop the bleeding and then proceed with the actual corrective surgery. You know, it's going to be cardiovascular instability versus resuscitation as a transfusion. That's everything that's going to be happening. And a lot of stuff will have to occur in that, in that situation. So that's, that's the presentation of the case. And again, so just as a quick summary, risk level low or high elective emergency dominant patient issue is this, this, and this location hospital and who do I need? And in more detail, you can outline all the different issues. And I found that this was the best way I could get across something succinctly to my boss. And then they could, you know, look at all the other detail that I've written in the charts pretty easily. Um, yeah, before we end there, any questions at all on any of those things we talked about? Cool. Well, yeah, really appreciate putting everything, you putting everything up on, um, on YouTube as well. It's all a really good resource and everyone in our department in Darwin, all the, um, you know, and it's just, and oh, nice. you know, it's very highly of you and your, your, um, yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, yeah, good on you.